Hello, Tom. Do you want Hello. to? My name is Tom Herbert, Hello. and today we're going to okay. look at high performance programmable parsers. This is work done um, at Saipanda. So it's myself, Pratish Khan, and we also have Arvin Viduri from Ventana on the project. The agenda for today. First, we will take a look at some protocol parsing fundamentals. We will introduce the common parser language, which is a JSON representation of parsers. Next, we'll look at the K parser. That's a kernel parser and it's CLI. Following that, we'll look at using K parser and XDP. And as a little bit of a bonus, we'll also show flow dissector as a helper function in XDP. And then finally, we'll look at upstream efforts and future development. So first off, uh, let's look at some parsing and some fundamentals about parsers. So protocol par parsing can be defined as analyzing a packet or a PDU to identify the various protocol headers and layers in the packet. And these protocol layers and headers, they follow some specification of the protocol definition. Parsing is really identifying them so that we can apply the semantics and use them in processing. The set of parsable protocols constitutes a parse graph. So the parse graph is contained of a set of nodes and the linkage between each of those uh, create the parse graph. Processing one packet is what we call a walk in a parse graph. And on the right side, we have an example packet uh, walk of ethernet IPv4, GRE, IPv6, and TCP. So we'll see that in a little, again, in a little bit later. So a parser then is a, mechanism that parses the protocols, which is basically implementing the parse graph and has the capabilities to walk uh, packets in the parse graph. Implementation wise, you can think of this as a finite state machine. It's often convenient um, to look at it from that point of view. So protocol parsing though, um, the main attribute, or I guess I should say the main kind of issue or impediment to it, it is a serialized process. So we've seen time and time again in the industry, especially router vendors, they trip over this in a sense. It's very difficult to process um, protocol headers of any complexity because of this requirement that they have to be processed one at a time. So it's been very difficult to paralyze. Uh, but that being said, it's also one of the most common functions in networking stack. So there's a lot of motivation to optimize this both in hardware and actually in software. So this is a graph that I often show at presentations. You've probably seen this before at the last net dev, but it shows the various, um, a parse graph that includes various protocol nodes, parse nodes for flow to sector. And we augmented this with some of the parse nodes that flow to sector does not have. At the bottom, we have the UDP switch, which gets us into UDP encapsulations. And on the left, we actually look at how do we process upper layer protocols, like protocols within T um, TCP. So effectively, they can all be thought of as being the same parse graph. The one thing to notice is this is a graph. Um, the root node is typically the Ethernet node. And we process the Ethernet node, go into the Ethernet protocol switch that gets us to the next Ether type, the node for the next Ether type. And in the case of IP, we have the similar switch. The red links in the graph are backlinks. These are encapsulation events where we go down the graph to a certain level we see an encapsulation and effectively means that we loop back up to the top of the graph. It's really encapsulation that has created this combinatoric explosion in the number of, of protocols that have to be parsed in a packet. So again, there's a lot of motivation to make things like encapsulation first-class citizen here. If we look at one example of a parse walk, this is the same ethernet <clears throat> Um, with IPv4, GRE, IPv6, TCP packet. And if you follow the blue lines, you'll see that for this particular packet, there is a unique path through the parse graph. So the nodes that are touched, the IPv4, GRE, and so on, those are the nodes that are visited by the parse graph because those are the protocol head headers that are in the packet. And protocol headers are always stacked. so. That's where the serialization comes in. We have to process the ethernet and then the IPv4 and then the GRE uh, in that order in order to properly parse the packet. So parsers have a certain mechanics. 
And it turns out if you look across all the protocols and really boil this down, the mechanics are actually fairly straightforward. There's only a few fundamental, um, I call questions, that the parser has to answer in an order to be able to do the parse walk. So the way parsers are typically designed, they have a concept of a current header. Uh, that's a current header that is under inspection. And current header uh, always has a byte length. So we have to know what the byte length is. That kind of defines the node uh, that we're processing. To go from one header processing to the next, we need to make a transition. And transitions, again, in the finite state machine terminology, are done by looking up a next protocol header in a table. So for instance, in order to go from Ethernet type EV4, we look up the Ethernet ether type, which is 800 hex for IPv4. We look that up into a table, and the table just maps 800 hex to the next node, which in this case would be IPv4, and then the parser knows to proceed to the next node in the table. So that leaves a parser with three basic questions that it has to ask in order to accomplish the parsing. So first of all, what is the length of the current protocol header it's looking at? Some of these are fixed length. Ethernet, IPv6 are fixed length protocols, headers, for instance. There's variable length headers, such as TCP, IPv4. In a variable length header, usually what entails is the header length is in a field in the packet. We have to read that field, possibly do some arithmetic on it to compute the header length, but that gives us the header length. The one that's a little bit of an outlier, but actually is fairly common, is when we determine the header length based on more of the contents of the packet. And a great example of this is GRE flag fields. In GRE, there's a field that has a number of flags. The presence of a flag indicates the presence of a field. Um, the flag's not there, the field's not there. In order to determine the length of the packet, we have to figure out which fields are present, which means we have to look at the flags, add up the flag lengths corresponding to all the set flags, and that gives us the header length of GRE. So once we know the, the header length, then the next critical question is, is this header length valid? Meaning if I start from the current offset of the header and I add the length, does that um, exceed the length of the packet? So obviously, if I'm parsing an IPv4 packet, I get a length, but that length would go beyond the length of the packet. I cannot continue parsing. I can't parse the IPv4 header because it's incomplete. And I can't parse anything beyond the IPv4 header because there, there is nothing. Even if the IP proto says there is, we have to check the length. Um, this is being done constantly. Uh, at last NetDev, I actually talked about a uh, flow dissector and how it does this. This is one of those things that can be really difficult. Basically, we have to do it at every protocol. So um, side note is that it's one of those things we do want to optimize is how we do length checking. So assuming that we have the length known and we have a correct length, then the next question is, what is the type of the next header? So the type of the next header is most relevant for non-leaf protocols. So IP, GRE, for instance. For leaf protocols, there is no next header, so it's a null action. In order to determine the next protocol, typically there is a field in the packet, similar to the length field, that indicates what the next protocol is. So in Ethernet, that's ether type field. In IP protocol, it's the IP proto field, and so on. So we need parsers to do something uh, useful work. So by parsing, yes, they would validate uh, the packet to some extent, but we also want to derive information as we parse the packet. This is called metadata collection and extraction. You can think of metadata as any information derived from the packet or the packet headers or the contents. This can include things like protocol field values, say IPv4, IPv6 addresses, header offsets. So maybe the programmer wants to know what the offset of the IPv4 header is. Uh, timestamps, header lengths, how long the headers are, and so on. The way it works is the parser can creates this metadata, which can either be pulling fields out of a packet or taking the metadata from kind of the metadata of the parsing itself and puts it into a structure. And that structure will later be consumed 
by a downstream uh, consumer to process that metadata and use it. The other additional function that's very compelling would be per layer handlers. So as we parse the packet, we, the programmer may want to do additional processing on that packet. An example might be when the programmer parses or when the program parses an IPv4 packet, we may want to validate the IPv4 checksum at that point. That's not normally something that a parser would be expected to do. So what we can do is have the parser call into a handler. The handler is very specific to that function. It could be uh, normal C code, for instance. Um, basically, it does the computation that it needs to. In this case, it would be computing the IPv4, IPv4 header checksum. If it's correct, it can return with a success and the parser can continue. If not, it can return and say the packet is bad and the parser would stop. These functions really have access to their own protocol layer. So in the case of the IPv4 checksum validation, the only information the handler needs is the actual protocol header. That's where the checksum is computed. Uh, they would also have access to all the metadata previously report, reported so that they can consume that information. OK, so given the basics of parsing, we can look at how we represent parsers. We have a goal here. So what we would like in a parser representation is a common, flexible, abstracted method to represent parsers. And the reason for this is, is uh, several motivations. So first of all, we know that parsers are best represented in a declarative, not imperative representation. So again, I talked about this uh, at last year's NetDev and the flow dis sector discussion. Parsers are naturally parse graphs. So that picture that I showed before, that actually is the way to think of a parser. And what we can do is make this parser representation basically match that. So the parser representation should be some sort of graph. When we convert that into imperative instructions, like in flow dis sector, it becomes a bunch of switch statements and if then else is really difficult to uh, follow program flow. So effectively what we wanna start with is a declarative representation of a parser. Given that we actually have um, another motivation, not only could this be a convenient representation like in a GUI, but this could actually be the intermediate representation of parsers for compilers. So in fact, this is what we intend to do is take a, uh, code, say written in C or P4, compile it into an immediate representation of the uh, parser, and that becomes uh, something we can use in compilers. So if we solve this, it also addresses a major problem in parser offload, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end of the talk. The solution we came up with, we call common parser language or CPL. This is a parser representation in declarative JSON. The high level objects are composed of parsers, parse nodes, protocol tables, uh, and a few others. It's designed to support nearly all the protocols and protocol constructs. Uh, the only one in the current definition, the only protocol that probably isn't supported would be HTTP, HTTP 1.0. Um, that's because that's a really complex protocol. I, think, I believe it uses regular expressions in order to just to parse. So conceptually, we could add regular expressions. It'd be um, a possibility. But at the highest level, the JSON looks like a parse graph. In fact, one of the cool things about JSON, obviously, is you can visualize it. And basically, we could reproduce that parse graph uh, from the actual uh, CPL code. JSON is also really easy to work with. Um, we have uh, a couple of Python scripts we'll talk a little bit about that um, show how easy that is. We can also have GUIs. One could easily conceive, uh, you can even have a programmable parser interface through a GUI where the developer actually just structures their uh, parse graph using objects in a GUI. Um, very simple, very easy. The nice thing about the uh, JSON is it's both machine readable and human readable. So it would serve uh, very well as that intermediate representation we mentioned and in fact, uh, one of the goals we do have is to introduce CPL as an intermediate representation in LLVM as both an intermediate representation of parsers 
but also any other constructs uh, similar to parsers, like some finite state machines could also use this technology. This is a graph of that from last year's NetDev also. I augmented it with some of the updated features. So the red circle is showing the placement of the common parser language in JSON. As I said, this is a output of the LVM as the intermediate, re intermediate representation. And then we'll take this and compile it into the various backends in a backend compiler. The objects, as I mentioned, uh, there are a few of them, I'll touch on them. So at the fundamental level, we have parsers. The most critical attribute of parsers are the root node, which is a parse node. And parse nodes are pretty much the workhorse of the parser. These are all those rectangle boxes. So we have parse nodes for TCP, IP, uh, whatever protocols the program wants. The parse nodes are annotated with the required uh, functions to parse. So as we pointed out, that's determining the next header or the header length and the next header type. The parser nodes that are non-leaf also include a reference to the next header table. And they would also include uh, metadata to extract. And again, the metadata is in the form of JSON descriptors of how to extract the metadata into that structure. Protocol tables basically are the glue, uh, the links in the parse graph. That's fairly straightforward. It's a table uh, key value pairs. The key is a protocol number. Um, the value is a node. So for instance, in an ethernet table, we might have a key value of 800 hex, which is IPv4. And then the target node is simply a reference to the IPv4 parse node. And then metadata rules and lists, these basically allow us to expand upon how the metadata is extracted uh, it's arbitrary, whatever the user wants, they can basically program these metadata rules and lists and then reference those in parse nodes when they want to extract the information. One of the key aspects of the common parser language in the JSON is that we have to, or we do parameterize functions that are needed in parser. Um, we make them represented as parameterized functions. And the best example of this is how do we compute a variable header length? So we can create a parameterized function that generates a, a per protocol function based on uh, the capital F there. And the parameters are the field offset, field length, field mask, Indian swap, multiplier, and add length. So with these parameters, we can produce a parameterized function, which is the next three lines to compute the header length. So first we would load the bytes from the given offset, we would mask them off. Um, if we have a mask, we need to perform a shift to get it down to uh, order no number. Some protocols have header lengths in two bytes, so we may need to do an endian swap. Uh, but once we have the number, then per the protocol definition, we may need to multiply that as we have to do in IPv4, for instance, to get the header length. And we may add a length, a fixed length, as we have to do, for instance, when we're computing the length of a TCP option. So with all of this, we can produce the functions per protocol to compute their header length. And the function for IPv4 then becomes F uh, with zero argument for field offset, one for field length, zero F for the mask, Indian swap is false, multiplier is four, and zero is add. If you put all these numbers into the equations above, you will basically derive the expression to extract and compute the IPv4 header length. In addition, there are several features in the CPL that are useful uh, for parsing some more advanced constructs. So I already mentioned the handler functions that could be represented in the common parser language. TLV parsing, we consider TLVs a first-class citizen. So we have a special parse node just for parsing TLVs to optimize that process. Similarly, flag fields like in GRE that I described, those have a special protocol node and parse node to process it. Encapsulation, as I mentioned in the parse graph, the red links in that graph are encapsulation. So this is also uh, very prevalent in, in the common parser language. So we encounter encapsulation protocol 
we increment the encapsulation layer and that gives us um, a way to store metadata for that encapsulation layer. Overlay nodes are useful in cases where we need to do a deeper inspection of a protocol header to really figure out what it is. And the best case example of this probably is GRE. So we can define a GRE base node, which is the first level of GRE. GRE though has a version subfield. And we need to look at that subfield to determine if we actually are parsing a GRE version zero or version one. So basically this would be at least two nodes where we have GRE and that base header node. And then we would proceed to either GRE V0 node or the GRE V1 node. So what we want to do in an overlay though, is when we proceed from one node to the next, we don't want to change the concept of the current header. It's still GRE. So that way the GRE base node, it sees the common GRE header. And when we go to the GRE V0 or V1 nodes, we don't move the cursor. So those nodes actually see, see the same header. So this is quite useful in cases where we have things like version numbers and protocols that require um, more analysis, but we don't want to have to force these to be two completely separate parse nodes. Counters are user-defined counters that are quite useful uh, to count events, whatever the program, whatever events the programmer wants to count, um, they can be used. These can also be used to store data in arrays in the metadata. And a good example of this is VLANs. So when we encounter VLAN tags in a packet, we may want to record however many VLANs are in the ethernet header. So counters can be used to this. Each time we see a VLAN header, we incre increment the counter. And in the metadata, we can use the counter as an index into a table of VLAN tags to store that information. Conditional expressions are used in cases where we want to make a decision whether or not to continue to parsing or some other action. And a good example of this is when we're parsing an IPv4 header, if we want to go to the transport layer and parse that in the same packet, we can only do that if the IPv4 packet is not a non-first uh, fragment or is a non-first fragment. It's not, not a non-first fragment. So in other words, if we encounter a fragment and even if the protocol is TCP, we can't parse the TCP header because it doesn't exist in a non-first fragment. So what we can do is we can set up a conditional expression. The conditional expression can change the frag or check the fragment number and the more fragment bit to determine if this is a non-first fragment, meaning if it's a non-first fragment, we can't parse the packet, so the parser has to stop there. If it is either a, a first fragment or it's not a fragment at all, then we can uh, proceed to the TCP layer and we can process and parse the TCP header. Limits uh, define a number of limits on the parser. Um, these are, again are perfectly or completely configurable. So some of these limits include things like number of nodes to visit, number of encapsulation le levels, the maximum number of those. We can also have limits on how we parse TLV. So for instance, in the case of TCP, we may want to have limits on the number of non-padding options or the number of options. The reason they have limits is really as a form of denial of service mitigation. So what we found is, for instance, um, when somebody sends out IPv6 extension headers, they could pack hundreds and hundreds of options into a single header. If somebody tries to parse all of those, regardless of whether it's in hardware or software, it's gonna be extremely slow. And that's basically the foundation for a denial of service attack. So what we can do is we can apply limits, uh, limit the amount of processing we're doing, and then have um, reasonable actions when the limits are exceeded. So we can raise errors or drop packets, um, whatever is the programmer wants to do. So I will go a little more into depth in metadata. This is kind of critical to understanding uh, both the kparser CLI as well as the common parser language. So in this model, metadata is written to a metadata block by the parser defined by the programmer. The contents of the metadata are basically up to the programmer, the specific fields, the organization of it is program defined. Typically what will happen is when the parser returns, the program then can cast the return data structure to the correct type. 
and then the program can access the fields of the metadata that were written in the metadata as simple field accesses in the data structure of the programming language. There are two substructures in the metadata. Um, these really don't have to do with the content, but they're more the structure of the person. One is the base metadata. This is metadata fields that are common across all protocol layers. And the other one are metadata frames. This is an array of structures containing fields for each encapsulation layer. And the best way to think of the value of frames is to consider that we might have multiple layers of IP and IP encapsulation, for instance. So in that case, the programmer may want to actually record, have the parser record all of the IP addresses in those three layers. So when the parser executes, when it sees the first set of IP addresses, it could write that into the first metadata frame, the metadata frames being a, an array of these data structures. When the parser encounters the second layer of encapsulation, it would write the IP addresses into the second frame and the third frame, uh, the, the third layer of encapsulation will write those into the third frame. So this way, the program can get all of the information for however many frames there are up to whatever limit they decide. Uh, this can be easily contrasted by the way with flow dissector and uh, TC where TC flower, where flow dissector allows only an inner and an outer layer of encapsulation. So currently in flow dissector, there's no way to get middle layers of information about middle layers of encapsulation. So this does it um, in a pretty generic way uh, that can easily scale. So we, we offer an ability to get all the information about the packet uh, that the programmer would ever want. So the metadata fields themselves can be referenced by a parameterization. So is frame is the first parameter that's either true or false. So is this data that belongs to a metadata frame? The MP off is metadata offset. We'll also see this in the CLI and the JSON. This is the offset of the field relative to either the base metadata or the metadata frame structure itself. The length is simply the length of the metadata and the NCAP layer is a layer of encapsulation. Basically, this is an index into the metadata frames. Each time the parser encounters an encapsulation layer and follows one of those red links in the parse graph, one of those backlinks, the encapsulation layer inc increments so that we write the information to the next frame in the frames array. This is an example of what a data structure for metadata might look like. And in this case, we have base metadata that's composed of the IP offset and TCP offset. So basically the programmer here wants the innermost IP offset and TCP headers. Maybe they're doing a TCP uh, protocol uh, control block lookup. And the metadata frame, this would write all of the information about each frame. So they're looking to get the source address, destination address, and the source port and destination port. And if you put these together, you get the uh, metadata structure, which is the base metadata followed by, in this case, five frames. Okay, so we have the common parser language and the data structures. Now we can look at the K parser and the CLI. K parser is an in kernel programmable parser. It's based on the open source Panda parser that we discussed at last year's NetDev. It is programmed via IP parser commands. So these are gonna be a set of IP commands to program it. And these use the normal Netlink backend to instantiate the parser in the kernel. We also have a couple of helper scripts. So going from the common parser language, JSON to the CLI can be done with one script. Also the IP command has a really nice feature. It can produce a type of JSON. We can now put that JSON, run that JSON against the script and get back to conformant uh, common parser language JSON. This K parser is also a nice segue into how we might do parser loads. I'll have a little bit about that also at the end of the presentation. This is a graphical representation of what K parser looks like. Um, in particular, this is one is interacting with XTP. If you look sort of at the center picture um, where the Panda is, that's our parser program. So again, this program could be written in C or some other languages. 
but we want to compile this into the common parser language. So in our case of Panda C, we use LLVM and the LLVM will compile that into the common parser language JSON. Then we take that, run that through the JSON to IP script that produces a set of CLI commands. Then when the user executes the CLI commands, this instantiates the kernel parser. So now we have a kernel parser running. The, on the left side, we see a use case of this. The user writes an XDP program, loads it into the kernel with an XDP hook point. We've created a helper function called XDPK parser that actually calls back into the kernel. And that's where we can run the K parser. K parser parses the packet from XDP and returns the metadata structure. And then on return, meta, the XDP program can consume that data and decide what to do with the output. So the difference here though, with uh, say using K parser and um, compiling this into eBPF for some um, programmable format, uh, first of all, it's obviously very flexible, but also you'll notice there's no compilation here required, uh, particularly to change this. So since it's all scriptable and dynamic, if we have a running parser, we can actually add protocols to it on the fly because these are CLI commands. So in that case, we're just adding CLI commands. That's a uh, one of the bigger advantages of having this sort of approach where we're using a CLI instead of uh, loading a program into the kernel. The kernel AP, uh, par K parser kernel API is pretty simple. Um, it can be called from various places in the kernel. So we've seen the XDP example. I have a little more depth on that in a moment. P4TC is also uh, intends to use kparser. The actual API is composed of four functions currently. kparser parse takes an SK buff, parses it. The inputs are the parse key and the metadata buffer and a metadata, metadata buffer size that's being written to by the parser. The underscore underscore kparser parse does the same thing, but it takes a header, um, raw header data as a pointer. And also it uses the pointer directly to the parser so we don't have to do a lookup on the parser key. The last two functions are for getting references and a pointer to the parser itself. So kparser get parser gets a reference. The input is a key. The key you can think of as the name of the parser or an ID. And the return is a pointer to the actual parser that we can use in the underscore underscore kparser parse function. And put parser uh, reverses that. One of the side effects of these functions when we call get parser, get parser it does free the, um, freeze the parser in the sense that no changes can be made. Uh, one thing we discovered is that it um, <clears throat> becomes problematic if we allow the parser to change while somebody's actively using it. So if we want to change the parser and somebody has a reference on it, release the reference, change the parser, and then we can get the reference again. So it creates a very systematic uh, way to make, their, make sure things are synchronized. But again, we don't have to reload the parser. We can augment the parser via CLI command. So the process should be a lot faster than had we had to reload it. So for the rest of the presentation, I'll sort of follow a example. So we're gonna add a five tuple parser with header offsets. Um, this will be a parser that will describe that parses IPv4 over Ethernet to get the UDP and TCP port numbers. It will report the offsets of the TCP UDP header and the IPv4 header. We'll extract the IPv4 addresses and the UDP TCP port numbers. And then from XDP, we'll call a function, um, the helper function to get the parse values and the metadata, and then we'll print those uh, values in XDP print. So let's start with the Panda C code. This is the Panda C code for tuple parser. On the left side in the yellow, we see the data structure. This is the metadata structure. And this will be the same structure that's implicitly used in the common parser language and also the CLI. So it's composed of four fields, two offsets, which are each two bytes, and the headers. So we have um, two IP, IPv4 headers, and the port numbers should actually be uh, UN16s here. So those are um, two half words. So that defines the data structure. If we go down to the extract 
functions. We have two extract functions. The extract IPv4. When this runs, it's going to extract the header offset of IPv4 into the metadata at the right um, offset. And it's going to extract the adder addresses. In this case, we just extract the addresses as the full eight bytes. The other metadata extraction function is extract ports. So this will extract the header as the L4 header offset, and it will extract the port numbers, which again, there are four bytes of port numbers. So we put that in uh, to the metadata ports. The green shows the Panda parser macros to set this up. So the first three macros are the parse nodes. So we have one macro for the ethernet, the IPv4 and the ports nodes. Uh, the operative arguments are the next header table. So for instance, for the Ethernet parse node, that's Ether table. For the IPv4 table, that's the IP or IPv4 parse node, that's the IP table. Uh, parse node is a leaf parse node. The protocol tables are then defined below. So those define the appropriate entries. So for instance, for the Ethernet table, we have one entry, which is the IPv4 value, um, Ether type and that maps to the IPv4 node. And then the Panda parser at the bottom just defines the parser, tuple parser, and makes the root node ether node. So when we compile that into the JSON using the LVM, we get a JSON that looks like this. So we can see that the parsers are represented. So this is our tuple parser. This is the root node. Uh, the root node is specified by the node name. We see our three parse nodes, one for ether node, one for IPv4 node, one for ports node. You'll notice that for the IPv4 node, we show how we parameterize the header link. That's under the header link field. So we see the field off mask, field length, and multiplier. Those correspond to the parameters in the parameterized function we talked about. We also see in the IPv4 and the ports node, the metadata extraction rules. That's very similar to the um, metadata that we talked about before. Uh, again, it's somewhat, somewhat parameterized. And then lastly, on the right, we have the protocol tables. So we have the ether table and the IP table. And again, this is simply an array of really key value pairs with references to the name of the nodes uh, to map to. Going back to the environment picture, we see that CLI Um, the video still goes on, but we, for the sake of time, we're going to ask uh, people, to, uh, we're going to pause for QA, right? We're going to uh, switch okay. to Don's slide. Okay. Uh, we can stop sharing. Don has control. Can you enable screen sharing? Uh, we can't see your screen yet, but we can hear you. All right. You can see that? We, we, yep, now we can. Okay, so let me go to where we were. Uh, that was the JSON. And we compiled that JSON um, into this uh, kparser CLI command. So these are actually the IP commands that we would run. And you can see that that particular uh, JSON and front end C code comes down to nine rule, uh, or nine commands. So I'm going to start from the bottom, um, go to the top. I'll explain in a minute why. But the iParser create. Uh, parser creates the tuple parser, gives the root node. And then we have our three parse nodes. All the information in the JSON for those parse nodes is contained in here. Uh, this also includes the tables, the metadata information. Uh, so basically, one of the, the parse node is, in a sense, completely uh, self contained and self defined. And the last part of this are the metadata rules. So these are the rules how to extract uh, this for metadata fields that we mentioned. So this is the CLI and basically the um, programmer would then take the CLI, execute it, 
uh, run in the kernel. And the when we run in the kernel, um, it just instantiates a parser. We have to do something useful for it. So we've actually created an XTP helper for this. Um, this is the, the detail on that. I won't go into it. Uh, but basically, the developer writes their XTP program. Uh, somewhere in that XTP program, they call the BPF helper XTP um, parse. Is XTP flow dis or XTP? Uh, there it is, XTPK parser. So this uh, calls into the kernel and calls into the K parser. The arguments are simply the packet itself passed in the normal XTP uh, buffers. And then we have the metadata, which is that metadata structure. It goes into the kernel, the metadata is written, it's returned to the XTP program, and then it can be processed. Uh, I won't go into this, but we did have an additional um, feature we can call the flow dissector now from XTP. It's good for comparison. Uh, performance comparison, it's still a work in progress. Um, the K parser, I do believe, will come reasonably close to flow dissector performance, although I do expect flow dissector to be better uh, because K parser is, as we talked about, parameterized. Uh, we did a flame graph. The patches for kparser were pushed um, a few hours ago. So they are on NetDev, uh, so you can take a look at that. Uh, future work, I'll just mention um, that hardware offload problem. So one of the problems we have in hardware offload, especially the sideband um, method, is that the kernel doesn't really know if the hardware offload is, exa is doing exactly what it expects. Meaning if the kernel offloads something, the semantics have to be identical to what the kernel had done or the kernel can't trust it. So the, the one of the benefits of having something like a common IR like this um, CPL is that we can actually do a hash over it and we get like a strong hash of that. And as long as that hash is maintained in the functionality on the left side, which is say going down into a hardware device and on the right side with a K, um, K parser, if everybody agrees on that hash, meaning they did implement the same functionality because the hash is over the common ancestor of that functionality, then what we can do is when we want to uh, start the offload, all we have to do is query the device and say, give me the hash of the program uh, you're running. Device returns that. And if it's equal, then we assume that it's uh, valid and we can run it. So. I'm thinking this is a way to solve the uh, what I call the fundamental problem of offloads, where the the kernel of the networking stack has to know conclusively that what is being offloaded will have the exact same functionality that the kernel had, and then we can actually trust it. And as I pointed out last year's NetDev, we can make that part of the um, part of the stack, which is the ultimate goal. Okay, so um, with that, are there any questions? Thank you, Tom. Uh, I guess it's dinner time, so I won't hold you too long. This one work? Yeah, I yep. think so. So, does the parser depend on all the headers being in the SKB linear or uh, burst buffer, or is it able to cross IOVs, for example? Uh, um, what was the last part of that? A able to cross, like, an I like if think of an SKB as basically uh, an IOV where the linear part is like oh. zero, et cetera. Uh, can it cross? Uh, so right now we we do pull up uh, just to simplify things. So okay. the assumption here is we'll pull up up to say 512 bytes of header. Um, that's typical also in hardware parsing buffers. And in this model, uh, we're actually directly parsing the buffer. Uh, same thing as uh, the, the flow dissector model. If you wanted to do the SKB method, uh, we could do that. Um, that would be a separate code path. The thing I don't like about that is every time we 
uh, encounter a new protocol, we have to do that pull up. So my preference right now, uh, do the pull up once. And if we have to do um, in the future, deal with uh, situations where we're not doing the pull up. Uh, yeah, we, we can we can deal with that. But what, what we have is working out pretty well because again, for the most common cases, the data is going to be pulled up anyway. And if it's not, then, you know, we'll do the pull up. And have you given thought to how to handle things like MPLS, where you basically need additional information as to what the next protocol is so you can keep going? Uh, if it's stateful, that would be um, more of a backend functionality. Uh, but the parser um, can program all the labels. Uh, it's very customizable from that point of view. So unless it's stateful, um, we, we can do any, I, I believe we can parse about anything uh, statelessly. Yeah, I mean, it's really a matter of knowing you've hit the end of the labels, you have to be told what the next protocol is so you can keep going. It's a dependent so it's, it's a dependent parse step, right? Yeah. That's what you're really trying to say. The, the next step of the parse depends on the previous step of the parse. That's the... Well, it it's it depends on what you mean by dependencies. If it's if we can anything that can be derived from a single packet um, with proper configuration, that's what kparser can do. If there's state meaning we we can't parse the packet correctly without understanding the state of previous packets, uh, that would be a different scenario. And in that in that case, I guess the best example is if we're doing something like IPsec. And we wanted to string these together, but in that case, that's that's a different layer. So, for instance, um, we have the ability to parse TCP streams as long as somebody else is uh, collecting the TCP uh, segments together, so we can parse the data stream. And then, can users ask for specific data on any request for parsing, or is it always however deep you went, you get all that metadata at once? Nope, everything is completely user defined. So user wants uh, anything from the packet, they can specify it. Like uh, like we explained, we have the ability to do multiple encapsulation frames. There's no, there's neither any fixed protocols here, nor any fixed metadata. Uh, everything is user defined. Um, from that point of view though, we do expect to have a, a set of canned protocols uh, one of the future work is we, you can note that whenever anybody parses IPv4, how you get the length and how you get the next header are always identical. So there's only one way to get that. So that could be canned. So user wants to parse IPv4. They just use the canned definitions for those. And then maybe they want to customize the metadata. Maybe they want the uh, TTL or uh, you know some field. Um, so they have complete flexibility there. So the, the metadata is uh, customizable uh, completely. So, um, okay, we have one last question. Um, we are, the, the, the facilities people are all looking at us funny. So yeah, uh, we need to, uh, and by the way, this is, quick... this is fascinating. This is super important. If there is, uh, if we, you know, if we need to do like a birds of feather or something, we can organize it, uh, ping Tom and we'll make it work. Just a quick question. Uh, uh, what's the intended way to use this parser at user space? For example, I think about uh, parsing the socket uh, at the XDP program, then somehow pass that metadata to the user space in with RF, RF XDP, or the intended way to redirect to packet to with AF XDP to the user and then parse it at user space, or both would be possible, or I just thinking about that. Thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. So first of all, in itself, having this in the kernel is useful. Um, obviously, attaching it to XDP, and given that almost every XDP program has to has to parse, so we anticipate this will be a faster, easier way um, for all of the XDP progr programs, especially ones that are interested in more com complex protocols, uh, to make use of it. So in itself, uh, the XDP hook is fine. And um, I think Jamel can probably talk a little bit about how we're using this in P4TC 
kind of with the same um, same value add. So there is usefulness in the kernel. If you want to get this to user space, uh, that's fine also. Uh, we can pass this in BPF maps. Uh, there's also work in XDP hints that I think will become uh, applicable to this. And then you can also talk about uh, how, we, how we offload this. So when we offload uh, parser, we may in fact want to get the metadata into the host. So that's, um, they would call that XP, XDP hints right now. Uh, but in this case, if the offload is actually um, guaranteed to be consistent and correct, XDP hints would actually be more than hints. We could actually say it's XDP critical information. If the host stack can trust it, then we could actually consume that information and in the host stack as if it's part of the stack. So th there's a lot of opportunities here. Um, the advantage obviously of XDP is that we have the whole uh, common platform. It's just a matter of the helper function, which um, has a lot of benefit in itself because it's really, one, one thing I would point out, it's really, really difficult to write a parser of any complexity in eBPF. And I think that's one of the one of the wins by moving that out into a much simpler way to write these, you know, where you don't have to go through verifier. I think that's that's a big benefit. But other than that, yeah, we can we can use the exact same capabilities XDP. When we hook this into TC, we can use those capabilities also. Um, Thank that, you. That's got to be the last word. There seems to be a question, but maybe you can take that offline. We do need to wrap up here. Uh, thank you, Tom. This was very good, uh, and hopefully. Uh, your last sentence of making uh, EVPF parsing easier is a generally good thing for society. Um, right, thank you. <laughs> that concludes the day. See you guys bright and early tomorrow morning.